In my mind, it's all about RSS. It's all about feed frenzied learning. Now, how do we use RSS to actually build a kind of environment where not only can you do what you do where you do it, but you can also bring it into context and new context through, say, a university setting or otherwise. So this whole syndication oriented architecture got me thinking. But like I said, there's many examples that come before it. Um, I don't have a screenshot of it, but there's Stephen Downs' EduRSS, which was the early example that I heard about, but I had never seen because I didn't come into this field until about 2005, right? So here's another example, aggressive. Aggressive was a kind of pro prototype of what I think a syndication bus could be and should be. And Aggressive was here done at UBC. And what it was is it was actually a way to bring RSS feeds together by unique tags so you can start discovering things. So you can start seeing how this works. So it becomes an aggregation space for all the work people are doing in their spaces and bringing it together in some unique way. So that's an example, Aggressive. Here's another one, and this was Edgeglue. And Darcy Norman and Bill Fitzgerald actually worked through this in Drupal, right? They worked through a way by which you could take all these different feeds out there and people and find, you find posts by keywords, by tags, by list of all feeds. And so when you bring all this open content that's just there by the nature of the blog and it has an RSS feed built in, what you can do is not so much worry about the kind of mechanism by which we publish, but rather the mechanism by which we start to bring that together and think about it and allow it to be relevant between content. So this whole edgeglue concept was really pushing. Well then Tony Hurst, who's from the Open University, actually had all of these course documents or all these courses in RSS feeds. So one of the things we tested, and it's a fascinating thing to me, grab the feed and republish it within a blog that anyone could take pieces of and remix. And so what he had done is he'd create a kind of intelligent feed that could bring all that stuff in. You have that stuff, you can remix it. The other thing he did is he made it time specific. So the RSS feed can post a new part of that course every day. Kind of like what he calls drip learning, right? Almost like a coffee. And I mean, this is stuff just happening. You see this? This isn't like an organization getting together. These are people just doing this stuff and imagining a model, a distributed model, but a powerful model for thinking about learning. Now, <laughs> there are many more examples. Recently, we had CCK, right? Connectivism and Connected Knowledge. This kind of takes this model to the next level in some ways. Everybody has their own space. Everyone does it in their own unique tools and brings it together in some kind of aggregated space, but not just with blogs, also with Wiki. They had Moodle forums, right? And there's this unique idea of the actual infrastructure itself being distributed. And what you have here is you have a way to kind of trace that. They sent out email updates about what are some of the posts to think about, how do we do this? So that distributed community really did leave. It wasn't an impulse to centralize. It was an impulse to rethink possibilities as they happen on the open web. And that's key here, right? All these models suggest that what we're doing in open resources are on the web right now. We kind of don't have to reimagine the web. We have to use it smartly, right? I mean, that's the amazing thing here. So <laughs> CCK, another great example. And then, you know, I love the TV show, but that's not what this is about. Um, the Wire is fascinating. So Philip Schmidt from P2P University, who I've been back and forth talking about, and he had this thing with Mozilla Open Education, where they were talking about models. And so he said, well, you know, the syndication idea, we can do that with Yahoo Pipes and build it right into peer-to-peer. -peer. And so he had another way at it with a tool that was freely available. And I think really solved some of the problems I was thinking through in terms of comments. But I'll talk about that in a bit, or maybe I won't. But <laughs> here's another example. Penn State University, they're using movable type as a blog situation. Well, when you search a term on this system, right, for these students who are blogging, you can actually get contextualized information from these open resources. So I'm searching here design, uh, democracy. I get relevant YouTube videos, relevant Flickr, relevant delicious. Now think about this. What they're doing is bringing in relevant resources from around the web into 
a kind of space for a university for publishing openly and freely and allowing that relevance to be kind of dictated by a certain amount of chance, serendipity, which we heard in Cogdog's presentation, is a powerful thing, right? Why reimagine it? Why not let it happen? So <laughs> one of the things that I think enforces or fuels this idea and has got me excited is the LMS as we understand it really thinks of the access as the course. And I think some of the models of the syndication hub moves away from that, right? The access is no longer necessarily the course, right? And when I think of an LMS, well, I don't think of him, but when I think of an LMS, did I mess up the, yeah, I messed up. Access of the course as a versus, and I'll talk about this, the access being the individual, right? And I think CCK or the Connectivism and Connected Knowledge course does a really good job of reframing the idea of that access on the individual and how that individual kind of plays into a larger question of what it means to build a community, even if for only 15 weeks. Um, so I'm interested in that question and how these systems kind of change that logic, right? The blog kind of gives you a space by which you're the individual, but it's not just a blog, it's just what I play with and what I know. So what the experiment we did, we played with this tool. Now, I wanted to show you all those examples to make something clear. WordPress is not the only tool that can do this. WordPress is the only tool I know. That's the problem. Once I no longer know it, it won't be a problem, right? But I think Drupal, you saw it. You saw the connectivism, which was kind of even disparate tools, right? There's a whole bunch of ways to do it. Yahoo pipes, a hack there. So there is no one necessarily overarching tool or dominant tool. This is just one example. Let me show you what some of this, some of these examples. So if we think of the CMS as a box, and here's my theoretical idea of design, right? I really do think of the CMS as a box, right? And here you have this kind of what should be an organic beehive becomes these boxes. You place push people in and you push them in there. Well, what happens when we reimagine the LMS as far closer to a honeycomb, right? or to this space that has no one center, right? All these individual spaces for me is the perfect metaphor for WordPress multi-user as I understand it as a figure of design. There is no one center. There's maybe a place to aggregate stuff, but everybody has their own space on the web through which they control, they administer, and they publish. And for me, that's the radical difference is you're saying to students, you're saying to professors, you can do it here, you admit it, you control it, you imagine it. They kind of reimagine that idea of control, which I think is key here. And with the syndication bus, and why the syndication bus is so freaking important, is if they have a feed, they don't have to do it on your institutional system. It doesn't necessarily dictate, you use my tools or you use nothing, right? And once we start stepping out of that, what do we imagine is we're looking for that data flow, right? We're not looking to kind of control and rebuild everything. So one of the things that happens with blogs, and this is kind of my whole idea is you kind of back into openness, or we did at least at the University of Mary Washington, right? Gardner Campbell, who just entered the room like Elvis, um, actually was, you know, our fearless leader. And what he did is he showed us a way that we could say, screw, I, screw the IT model. Screw the whole idea that we gotta go through this and build this. Get a Bluehost account, six bucks, a six bucks a month, and do it. Set up your own WordPress, set up your own Drupal, play with this, figure it out, be a practitioner. Don't just talk about it, and just don't think of yourself as a kind of mindless drone who's working within a system that doesn't work, like Blackboard. He's like, reimagine that model by yourself, and build it up. And that was a kind of new approach for me to instructional technology. We're not just practitioners, we're not just kind of IT help. We're asked to be creative and to think about design and think about what works. Now it's not perfect, but that gave us the leg up, right? We were able to kind of say that. One of the things that's funny about blogs is blogs kind of by default are open. And what we kind of realized with Mary Washington when we were doing all these experiments, so we had 60, 70, 80 blogs all over campus, right? That they were open. People were finding them. People were commenting on them. I mean, we didn't have a kind of, you know, dictum, we're open, 
right? I'm more open than you. You should see how open I am, right? No, we just were doing it in the blog. Google, oddly enough, picked it up. People, oddly enough, use Google. They search and they find. And so you bring this weird kind of connection that isn't dictated by any one thing. And I think chance plays a really interesting point. But you can't have that chance if you're not in some ways open by default. And I think that's a kind of mechanism of design. And the other mechanism is for ability for what you have out there and what you've published to be able to flow freely between spaces. And that's that notion of we have these resources. Tony Hurst, read his block. I don't understand it, just read it. Because <laughs> what it does is it shows us that you can think about content in so many different ways, but you can only think about it in relationship to where you contextualize it and how. And I think Tony Hurst, you know, when he says this stuff and when he thinks about it, he showed me that what it means when we talk about RSS is we're meaning about a new flow of data, a new way of thinking about which not only data, but relationships flow. And the design is key to that. I mean, think about Twitter. How did Twitter as an interface design change some of the notions of our flow and of how we follow things, right? It's a really powerful model when we think about design. So <laughs> this is probably why I'm here. Forgive me if you've heard me talk about UMW blogs before. Um, UMW blogs is, you know, a blogging system, blog, 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 right? I wish John uh, Beasley Murray was here. When I first came to Another Voice, he was like, blogs, bloggity, blog, blog, blog. I never stop saying that. Whenever I go into a class to talk to people, I'm like, bloggity, blog, blog, blog. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, oh, don't you know what I'm doing? I'm quoting John Beasley Murray. Um, but UNW Blogs is an experiment we had two years ago. So after all that syndication talk, after all these questions of the bus, we went back, Gardner Campbell and I had a kind of fateful discussion on several occasions. And what we did is we said, well, blogs are gonna be our kind of space where we make this content open, where we ask students and faculty to engage, and we kind of create a community from the grassroots. Well, we started that the first semester, it wasn't even called UNW Blogs, it was called ELS Blogs, and we had about 100, um, we had about 100 courses, no, 100 students on it, a little less, and one of the things about Gardner Campbell is to watch him run a course with blogs is next to magic, because there is no dictation of what you need to do on the blog. All you need to do is engage honestly with the work that you're reading. And what happened is the students did. But they didn't only engage honestly. They engaged a wide range of stuff. They embedded YouTube videos. They embedded other questions and other things they had became a part of that conversation. So I felt like there was, we were building up a community by not dictating it as, here's a resource that you use. No, here's your space that you build and you create and you think about intelligently as part of your education. So we went from that you know, very modest start to last night's numbers, there were 296, no, 2,900 users and 2,300 blogs on this system. So it exploded. And my theory of why it exploded is because that idea of giving people their own space and allowing to them to do what they do is a powerful one. And rather than stepping in their way, saying you can do this how you do it, and we can help you, but this isn't the only tool you could use, right? It doesn't become a mandate. It becomes a possibility. So I think that was one of the real powers of UMW Blogs. <laughs> how we used this and how we started to think about the syndication model was with a couple of plugins in WordPress. Um, the plugins we used are called Feed WordPress and this other one, which is a site-wide tags pages plugin. Now, it's a very simple model, and you could do it in all different applications, but the thing is, is all these links here of posts actually link out to the student's own space. So when you click on that title, it brings you back to the student's blog. And if they tag it correctly, everything tagged with a specific course blog, uh, tag and it's coming off that site-wide feed, actually will pull directly into this course. So it's still theirs, but immediately through aggregation, you create a relationship between students and what they've written. And this aggregation model is kind of how we've kind of hacked together, literally, that syndication bus using WordPress. And what we've done is we said, this is your space. Call it a portfolio, call it your blog, call it your website, call it whatever you want, but it's yours. And you can think about it intelligently, you can frame it, 
but it doesn't have to be on UMW blocks. All we need is a feed from wherever your space is. And so, you know, we had this model. But one of the things that's crazy about the blog is we kind of started to say, is, is it a blog? Well, yes, it definitely is a blog, and I think you need to hold on to that idea. But what happened, the amazing thing happened when we started kind of letting it loose, is people were like, oh, we can make a website out of it. I can make a kind of, people are starting to create dorm information sites. People are creating group sites and aggregating them together. They're actually taking it and do their own thing. Artists are starting to create artist portfolios, right? They see the value of these spaces as something beyond just, this is my core site, I have to do my homework. They see it as an easy way to publish online. So we did a little semantic play, and we said, it's an educational publishing platform. And it's open, and you can use it. And what happens is people do use it, because it's easy enough. And so if I go on here, here are some examples. So we had students and faculty who were fascinated by this. And one of the fac faculty, Claudia Emerson, who's great, she's amazing, she won a Pulitzer um, for one of her books of poetry, coolest person you ever meet, she's like, I want to have my students create a literary journal. And what she did is she basically used the UMW blog's manner, that kind of framework, to actually build this blog as a journal. So no longer did it have this sense of a blog, it became these literary journals, we could hack the code. A lot of the newer journals have their own domain, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means. But this became a space where it wasn't limited to the logic of a blog. And the same here. We had an art history uh, professor who created an actual exhibit. And one of the things that's amazing about this exhibit, people search Venice a lot online. So in the first month, this, visit had 30 th this site had 30,000 visits. Over the last six months, it's had like 150,000 visits. And that means these students work. They all put papers in there. This is kind of an analysis of particular parts of Venice culture. They've been viewed and commented on widely throughout the internet. And it's kind of this openness by the nature of the system or of the design of that system, right? Another question here, or another example is digital history. Um, Jeff McClurkin, who's another professor at University of Mary Washington, and really it was the professors and students who made this happen. They wanted to experiment with an idea of how many projects can we imagine as a resource for the community. So one group, and this is Shannon Hauser, who was supposed to be here today but couldn't make it, so I apologize, but they worked on a project called Fred Markers. Now, I live in uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia, and I don't know if you know much about it. The Civil War is a current event there. It's always <laughs> happening. It never goes away. Um, so given that, we actually have um, a great amount of historical signs, right? And they're all over. So what this group did is they went out and they documented the signs. They did research on it. And then they opened it up. And they had this really kind of sophisticated site, which through UMW blogs was actually giving out information to the community. And it's funny, it's one of the few times the community blogosphere in Fredericksburg was interacting with us. They're like, look at this great resource built by UMW for us. And they were like, oh, they're just not doing, you know, Blackboard, or they're just not sitting in their classes in the silo, they're actually giving back to the community. And, you know, as with most colleges, the community relation is strained. And this is one way to kind of think of what we do as a public university is not only open, but relevant to our community. And I think this is a really powerful project for that. Um, another question, another example is, and this is one of my favorite, this is an audio site. It's called 18th Century Audio by Marie, Professor Marie McAllister. And what she did is she had her students actually record um, poems from the 18th century, do the recording, and upload them. Well, what the students started to realize, as did she, is there's this resource out there called LibriVox that has a whole bunch of recordings. Right? People put them out there in the public domain. It's a great resource. Well, they started kind of supplementing their collection. So they have like one of the biggest collections of 18th century poetry online. What's cool is the LibriVox community picked up on it and they said, oh, look at this. We could use these students' recordings to create an anthology of 18th century poetry read online. And so the community did that on their own. And so that interaction, and this is, really gets to what Dave Cormier talked about today, is that community can happen in all sorts of ways. And even if it is passing, right, it happens in different ways and we kind of can't predict it. 
But I think the kind of idea of defaulting to openness makes it possible. And it's a really powerful one. <laughs> okay. Another thing is as we think about design, and this is where my mind is right now, um, Twitter has kind of taken over the web, right? When I went to South by Southwest this year, it is like Twitter just came out for the first time. Everyone's like, are you on Twitter? I'm like, hasn't it been around for like two years? And like everyone was, all they were talking about was Twitter. It weirded me out. But I think one of the reasons why is because, and I'd be interested to know from you how you feel about this, the interface and design on Twitter is fascinating as a way to kind of scan and click. And a lot of people have talked about, and I don't know if it's true, Twitter's replacing feed reading, right? The RSS reader's going away. And Tony Hurst, again, had this amazing post talking about why is Twitter so successful as opposed to the RSS feed? Well, it's that idea of following, right? That kind of sense of, here's follow. It's not where you've got to figure out what that little orange icon is, get a separate reader and do it. And it was just kind of really subtle post upon what are these design questions? Well, rather than doing forums, one of the things we're imagining is this is a theme for WordPress multi-user. It's called P2. And what this does is it allows you to have a streamed conversation or forum, as like with Twitter, for a class. One of the cool things we're working on is, can students who use Twitter, they could do it if they're just a part of the system, but could they feed their Twitter feeds in? And they can. Now we just gotta figure out how to feed them by hashtags, but then what they're doing in their own space can immediately become relevant to that core space, and then you can move on. But it's still theirs. And so it's that idea of tagging or filtering and syndicating that I still think is driving a way to bring these resources together somewhat organically and powerfully. Um, and that's why the syndication bus still remains so relevant to me. But blogs are dead, right? right and this is a, a picture that I think Darcy Norman took of Nancy White's presentation at No Other Voice this year. And um, I think it was for Alan's presentation where he talked about blogs are dead. And one of the things that's really interesting to me is when I think about the blog being dead, I kind of get sad because I still blog. I blog a lot. So if it's dead, I'm kind of irrelevant, which might be a good thing, right? But at the same time, I don't think blogs are dead. What I think they are is they're kind of framing the design of the web as we move forward. And that design of the web as we move forward is these aggregation points of all your different kind of identities online. All the different spaces in which you live. Flickr, YouTube, your blog, Twitter, right? What it becomes is it becomes a space to aggregate that online identity in some sophisticated way. And what we're doing at Mary Washington and several other universities are doing, we're not unique to that, is giving a place for people to play with that, right? And rethink that aggregation model. Now, this is where I think the buck begins and ends with me, is I love all this stuff, but what I love about it is I have more people to talk to and I have more things to figure out and more people to bother. Because part of being part of a community like this is you become a real bother to people. You always comment, you're always like, this is the reverend and I have this kind of you know, larger than life persona I play out. I have this crazy Cotton Mather icon from the 1976 uh, Marvel team up comic. It's great. But you didn't know that Cotton Mather was a supervillain. <laughs> but he was and he was one of the few supervillains that could actually beat Spider-Man. It's wild. Um, so <laughs> anyway, this is, a, this is a, a kind of a model, and I'll be talking about this more tomorrow, I think, but this is the model that I'm really interested in right now. One of the things that WordPress multi-user affords is the ability to map your own domain, right? And if we start thinking about it, and I think one of the presentations that's coming up next that I think is key right here is a presentation on identity. And what we need to st start thinking about is can we allow people not only to frame, but aggregate their identity. With WordPress multi-user, we have this cool thing. We can just map someone's domain if they want to play with it there. So why buy an email? Why give them an email? Why not give them a domain? And think about the permanence of that domain. As they come in with it, they keep it four years, but then they take it and they bring it to their own space. And everything they've done still is relevant, still has the relevant links. That's the space. And you also have a connection to them. I realized this when actually, Alan blogged about Gardner's blog. Because while Gardner may have moved from one place to the other, his address remained stable. And you could follow him and find him. And what does that mean for our students to kind of think about this space that they concern, that they own, they inhabit, right? And they take with them when they go. I mean, to me, this domain of one's own is a real interesting model. And I think it kind of 
pushes us forward. Now the other thing, because WordPress multi-user is open source, um, because it actually has a huge community around it, many of them in the ed tech field, um, you could do some cool things with it. So here's an example of one of the things we've done that I think, I said this before, but when I did it, I thought this was going to be like, oh my God, this changes everything. The model's over. But it didn't. Nobody really responded to it. But that's, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a visionary before my time, right? Um, so here's the cloning the empire. WordPress multi-user has this crazy thing within it. And it is that you have a one, per, one WordPress multi-user install. Well, within that, you can embed another entirely distinct install on a separate domain, all running from one database, all running from one install, which means that we had a university who was not in a situation to experiment with this because their IT program didn't want them to. So we were talking, and through a connection, they're like, well, can you set us up with a blogging system? I was like, well, that's no problem. If you can give me eight bucks for a domain, I can completely clone everything we've done in UMW blogs on our system. So you don't even need web host space anything and give you your own space. And you could play with that. They set it up and they've been running with it for a year. It cost them $8. Now, is that free? No, because now they have people, they got to get people on to think about what it means instructionally for teaching and learning, for imagining that. But the actual implications for the actual web, it's cheap. It's, it's so cheap, it's crazy. Duke is doing their own thing. They mapped their own domain on ours just to experiment with it for the summer because their IT system couldn't get it up quick enough. I mean, that's sharing resources. That's bringing connections in. Now think about this. This is my grant idea. I'll throw it up there, right? So you have this. You have this mechanism. You have all these different schools in this database. How can we make relationships between what they're doing? How can we bring these various institutions together through tags and relationships? Oh, this person's reading Frankenstein? Well, so is this K through 12 class. Or so is this class over in Longwood. Or so is this class at UVA. And Virginia's an interesting place to be right now because I think I, I yell so loud on my blog that there's a lot of people in Virginia who are doing something, if not with WordPress multi-user, but definitely feed-based. So there's that idea of the syndication hub amongst and between universities. And there was a kind of a discussion about policy at lunch, and I'm out of my element with policy, but one of the things I'm fascinated by is how you can think about questions of design to make some of those relationships real and apparent, and to show that what's happening in one university has some real reflection on another, and you can bring them together. There's another big question here that I'm kind of alighting, but I think it's good to open up, and I hope I get a question about it in the question area period, is why do it institutionally? I mean, Lee, you brought this up, and this is a good question. Why do we do this stuff through an institution? Let everyone get their own space, right? Have their own space, own it. We have to worry about so few things. Well, that's fine. I have no problem with that. But then what we need to think about if we're going to do this institutionally is some kind of way to syndicate it intelligently, to bring it together, and that model of the bus returns, right? How do we allow this stuff to become relevant between? So <laughs> there's the radical reuse. And I kind of think of this as, I mean, every, each RSS feed is kind of a point of light, right? And what you do is you can imagine that space if how you kind of subscribe to one, how you subscribe to an individual, how you subscribe to people. A feed, one of the things to me that's interesting about the design right now, and I don't know where to go with this, because Twitter is so lively and so personal and you find out so many different things, the RSS reader seems a little bit more stale. I mean, you s I still use it. I have to, to get most of the stuff I'm finding. But it's a very different idea of vitality in those two spaces. And I think one of the things we got to think about when we think about design is to some way visualize the vitality of everything that's going on and find some way to relate it meaningfully. And I think the syndication bus, as I imagine it, is one way at it or one way to think about it. And it's not premised on any one tool. I think it's premised on an idea that you give the people their own space that they control, that they use to publish, and you find some way to intelligently connect it. So <coughs> that's my thinking about design. That's kind of the idea where I'm at right now, and I'm actually going to give it back to you for questions, ideas, senses of that and your, and your idea. Does that make sense? So I really came here with a model in mind in terms of syndication, but not with a sense of I have it answered, right? 
But I am fascinated by this model because it's worked pretty well for us at UMW as a way to think about it. It's also been pretty inexpensive. And we see that a lot of schools are kind of taking it up. For example, a lot of the technical and conceptual I help get comes from UBC. Comes from people like Andre Mollen, who's one of, my, one of his biggest fans, because the stuff he constantly does, he makes open, and I can steal from him. And then we can actually exchange ideas about what works. But that's not an organized body. That's just a group of people doing this at their different institutions. Well, Chris. Chris, I'm out from the Twitter constellation. Sure. Then, um, does the average learner have the time, interest, or inclination to learn how to use the tools as you're proposing? Yeah, that's a good question. And the problem with the tool, or maybe it's not a problem, it's one of the reasons we kind of settled on WordPress is it's really simple for people to use. It's one of the best user interfaces, right? Um, and the other thing is, unlike something like Blackboard or another LMS where everyone says it's kind of, it's so simple. No, they're used to it. There's a kind of a downtime to learning that interface. It's just a model of, this is an interface they'd actually use after they left higher ed. Who's going to use Blackboard when you're done with college? I mean, you, yeah, it would be impossible. And there would be no reason to. So I think that's kind of an argument that gets you into a tautological, like you don't have time. Well, you have to take time to learn a tool. But the thing is, Chris, or to the person who commented, if you have a syndication bus that's robust, a syndication bus that's robust, it doesn't matter. They, ma they pick their tool and they feed it in intelligently, according to tags and stuff. So then they'll learn the tool that they know. Right? So then it kind of makes it somewhat that much more invisible. Yeah. I was going to say, it's, it's not a tool, it's a space. Yeah. And so you're not trying to force people to use any tool. You're trying to force people to have a space, which I don't know if you should be allowing, be forcing people to have spaces or not, but kind of it gets to the point where if you don't have a space, you get lost in the world. So well, and it's also... It is optional to a degree. Now, when you blog for courses, you do. But the whole question that brings in this, and that's why I'm excited about uh, Darcy and King's talk, is this question of I digital identity. It's part of what we're teaching right now in higher ed, or part of what we should be teaching right now, is how to think about and frame that identity critically online. What it means. How to kind of inhabit this space. What it means for you as you move beyond it. You know, and we've kind of extracted ourselves from that role a little bit with Facebook and all that stuff, and that's good. But there are professional uses for this. There are other ways to imagine our kind of communities and organizations both within academia and beyond. So I don't think it's a clean cut anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I used I used to work for Webster, which is now Blackboard, and I don't recognize it. Anymore, but I do see the value of some of the, the tools and services that the CMS. Sure. Has. So I personally am just really pragmatic about it, and I say use both. So yep. I'm wondering because I know that you're sort of anti-establishment on pushing this and getting it because you are, Jim. I mean, you are. But not really, because I figured use a good tool, but sure. use a tool that's going to actually give you your stuff back. Sure. And let you own it. What I'm wondering is, maybe you should, maybe I'm saying, I think you should go further. I think you should do, I think you should combine these. Like what, Emily and I just came back from Trinidad, where we were teaching, doing emerging technologies around how do you integrate the two. So how do you bring your blog into your CMS so that it can happen in the safe place that needs to happen while you're in your university, but also keep it so you can continue on with the rest of your portfolio, exciting reflection stuff you want to take with you. But really, I think what we need to do is we have to move away from like the left-right divide. I should kind of meet in the middle. Well, you lose all the context if you bring your blog into the CMS and then you can't get it out. My again. question is, do you? I don't think you can. Well, well blog out. itself can be a safe place. I mean, we yep. use yeah. uh, the University of Calgary we use blogging for a bunch of stuff, and some of the most powerful blogging communities are what would be considered a, a walled garden, essentially drop interface for CMS, but using WordPress. Sure. And the fact that they're doing that gives them the toggle they can throw. But if they want to go open the can, but if they, if they want to go to the same place, we've got that. I'm going to talk a little bit about it in the, in the next session, but uh, there, there are ways to do that. Oh, yeah. no, no, and I, and I realize that. I guess what we found is that there's sometimes places where people want to have, they're familiar with the same there are some things that they're doing. And it's just, it's difficult, right? It's difficult to send people all over the place and be like, just, I just want one place. 
Well, I, I've caught myself, yeah. I mean, in my role, I, I consult with faculty members on how they, how they do mm -hmm. stuff like that. And I've caught myself more often than not lately saying, just do it in Blackboard. Do the yes. discussion board. Because exactly. yeah. if they're doing stuff in Blackboard already, bolting on a blog, if that's what it's going to be, is going to be one more damn tool we have to deal exactly. with. And so use it, suck it up, use the discussion board. It's not perfect, but it gets the conversation. But that's also a model of a community or an idea of thinking, in a, whether institution or class person, about what it means to be out. I mean, and that's going to change from professor to professor and from class yeah. to class. So we can't make them do it. No, no, no. And I don't think there's, I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is part of what I think is interesting about UNW blogs is it's not compulsory. No one is made to, to do it. But it's been open and it's worked, I think, part of because what people get by putting it open. They realize there are real benefits to it. Lee, I knew you had your... Oh, it's really a crappy question. You, that one. Um, but you mentioned Facebook and uh, I've been really reluctant to get into Facebook and happy ever since it allowed me to just feed all my real stuff in. And strangely, I'm getting a lot of interesting connections through Facebook for people who have their space in Facebook, but that's a real problem because yeah. they're not getting out of Facebook. So what if people, there's millions of points of light, well we've got billions of points of light potentially, but they're locked up in Facebook. So Facebook kind of takes over the internet and we, we lose all this openness and the greatness of it. Well, and didn't Facebook just buy friend feed? Is that right? Yes. I mean, and I think that's a question that George Siemens pointed to but was talking about Google on his blog post. But it's a real question. I mean, one of the things I like about WordPress, one of the things I like about open source tools, not just WordPress, but is that you feel like you have at least some ownership and power over that community and engagement in that community and involvement. And it changes it when you start thinking about questions of Facebook, you know, user terms, now friend feed, Twitter as well, Google as well. I mean, there's some real questions. And the open source, I mean, the relationship between open source and open content has already been made by David Wiley and others, right? And I think one of the things we really need to think about with open source is how key that is to still have that control over what we do and where we do it. And WordPress multi-user and UMW blogs is very important as an open source tool for us to experiment and innovate. We can't do that in WordPress.com. We can't do that in Blogger in the same way. And so it allows us to kind of have that hub and rethink some of that syndication points. But yeah, you're never going to reproduce a Facebook where you have all your community. I mean, in terms of what we're doing, probably, I imagine. And I think one of the, I, th I think that one of the uh, big differentiators here, though, with all of this, is that, in my from my perspective as a as both a teacher and a student and everything else, is that the CMS is a very top-down driven environment, right? It's controlled by the faculty member, and so in a lot of ways, so I can wrap my blog in there as a faculty member, really easy to drop it in there. But what I can't do really easily is let my students have their own space that they carry with them, horizontally across the the curriculum. And I think that that's really inherently the long-term problem with the integration piece there. There's, the CMS is not a personalized space for anybody but the faculty member. And I think even saying it's a personalized space for a faculty member is a pretty rough thing to say. And it's important, too, to capture that um, course space. It's, it's important also to capture that moment where people come together for 15 weeks and talk about something and make it relevant. So the syndication model was a way of kind of reproducing that, but still giving the individual their own space. You know, so kind of working horizontally with the individual, but then also bringing those together for that relevant moment. I'm sorry. I guess I just have to follow up on your point. I really, I totally agree that the CMS is totally down. Yeah, really are. Really but in, in terms of like tools, really, I mean, we use technologies. I mean, technology is not used as a pen as a technology, right? Whatever you need to use to get the job done, you use it uh -huh. at times, right? Like really, when the, when the rubber hits the road, that's what you do. So I guess my question is, when we talk about WordPress, I mean, I'm a big fan of it, but I also feel like I'm pushing WordPress to the edge of where it can go. Yeah. I feel like Brian and I are working on projects together, I'm working on projects about myself, or I'm putting things together with WordPress, and it is frustrating. I agree. I mean, like the themes, yeah. don't even get me started on the themes. Oh, yeah, and the latest <laughs> upgrade. And it frustrates me when we come to sessions like this, and Emily and we're just talking about this, when we say, oh, WordPress is so easy. I mean, seriously, it feels like yeah. a marketing play. I mean, I work for marketing. We don't want to say that. It is complicated sometimes. But the thing that's powerful about it, I think, at least it has been for us, is that it creates a model for syndication that's real. Yeah. I mean, and that's simple. And that doesn't cost us really much in terms of the infrastructure. So we could actually play with that concept. But I don't think of it as an end game. Like, okay, we have WordPress, that's it, we're done. But it's almost been my space within which to say, okay, here's that idea of the syndication bus I've been following, here's a way to do it. Or actually, you know, attempt it. I mean, but I guess when you're pulling to WordPress being difficult, it definitely can be. Oh, no. I mean, I mean if you're using it as your web space for your like, CMS or your 
has to replace it. And you start pulling it and you're like, I want discussions. I want to be able to make sure I'm following the content. Like, make sure that we've got the dialogue points. You try, try doing that with the professor, spend you know, a few weeks with them. It's really complicated. Yep. And being a student in that course is exactly. a lot of fun. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. And it's really hard to follow. I hope this, this conversation continues online, but we are running out of time, but we've had two hands from that. Um, I just wanted to continue a little bit um, on what Catherine was saying. Actually, when you were saying the the cloning um, cost them kind of like you know six bucks for the domain, um, eight bucks for the domain. <laughs> Sorry, the problem is is for them. But what about the cost for UMW blogs as opposed to just bandwidth and database space and because that. As it gets bigger and if you like, because making a cloning it that way is easy for one university, but doing it for twenty, um, that's why there needs a the different model. model. The syndication bus laying on top of it would be an interesting one. But I'm also one of the things is the other thing that always comes back to scale, right? How will this scale? It will never scale. I kind of did the math, right? Over the course of two years, we had three th three thousand blogs, three thousand students, about twenty three hundred blogs. Okay, that's with a tremendous amount of uptake. In five ten years. I don't even know if WordPress multi-user will be around. It probably won't be. What are we going to get to like 10,000 blogs, maybe? And so that's going to be our scale. I mean, this scales up to 100 or 200, right? So you can have that much, and you could play with it. But I don't want to think of, I'm not interested in thinking about those issues right away. I'm interested in thinking about what's possible and what is the kind of following the logic of design and where it's bringing us. And like allowing a, a university, even if just for a year, to play with a model, to experiment with it, and then if they want to host their own, which they're probably going to, just export it and let them go. So, I mean, I think for that, I mean, it's a way to kind of be nimble and to make these attachments and relationships rather than kind of only filtering it through, well, I have to go through central IT, I have to imagine this. No, there's other ways we can collaborate and work through this stuff together. And it, it's easy. I mean, that's not that hard. Maybe Speaking WordPress. Speaking of that collaboration, <laughs> if we can continue this discussion, I don't think we're going to resolve the issues of learning and bringing people into the community and the end game of, of these kinds of systems and WordPress and commercialism, et cetera, now. Yeah. But there is the conference tag and blogs and all these cool hive tools out there. So maybe we can try using some of those. Continue, but let's give Jim a, a round of applause.